एक मिनट रुक जाओ रेडी होने दो चलो ये कर लेते हैं भी एक रेडी इंट्रो हाय आई एम अक्षय हाय दिस इज सौरभ एंड यू आर लिसनिंग टू द फाउंडर थीसिस पॉडकास्ट we meet some of the most celebrated startup founders in the country and we want to learn how to build a unicorn hi uh, my name is shrinath uh, i'm one of the co-founders of this company called adnikul cosmos where we build small rockets i've often seen my child pretending to be riding a rocket to explore the solar system and this is such a universal dream that some of the richest men in the world are putting in considerable resources into building rockets and escaping earth's gravity even if it's just for a short while and i'm really proud to present our guest for the show a man who has built together an amazing organization that is building a made in india rocket that will be completely 3d printed and will allow the world to launch things into space cheaply and quickly Shrinath Ravichandran has had an amazing journey starting from his humble beginnings in Chennai to a career in Wall Street firms to finally returning back to Chennai to set up Agnikul Cosmos which is currently just a year away from launching its first rocket to space and making India very proud. Here Shrinath telling Akshay Dutt about how he developed an interest in science and physics. My mom is a physics teacher uh and my dad is a civil engineer okay so so there was a certain uh, uh like a certain respect for science while you were growing up as a kid like like that was like, like it must have got you curious about science as a discipline absolutely uh actually it's more than just my mom and dad i grew up in uh, uh you know with my uh, maternal grandparents as well in the same uh, building and uh, my granddad as well as an electronics engineer and and my aunt who's my mom's sister she is also a physics teacher so yeah i've had my fair uh, dose of being exposed to science early on uh, and particularly physics early on yes did you have like any mad scientist experiments as a kid which went wrong or something like that <laughs> no not really uh, but i was actually a very avid uh, reader of so i think my when i was like some 10 years old or something around that age i got this uh, quiz book it was called astronomy quiz book i don't know if they still make those uh, should i say look it up now that i'm telling this to you uh, that actually is like this you know sort of this is actually for that age group uh, somewhere between you know 8 to 12 years and it's about all these it's like an faq format uh, book so it's not like you're actually reading a textbook which feels very dense at that age right and at the same time it's also not like too little it actually has a lot of this question answers question answers and all answers are about like a couple of paragraphs something like which is the biggest planet and stuff like that yeah yeah but they go little deeper than that but yes that's exactly right that's exactly right so that's where my that that was that is that, that is the right. that is what that's what i did when i was really young uh yeah no no mad <laughs> experience <laughs> that. so so that like sparked your passion for space were you also into like you know uh, science fiction and stuff like that yeah yeah yes yes that's actually uh, exactly how my my curiosity for space started because of this astronomy quiz book i think and then after that i uh, I, there was this lending library if you remember those things used to exist uh, yeah yeah i remember <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah. so yeah someone told me about this uh, book called uh, 2001 a space odyssey so and that is actually uh, around i think when i was in like 7th or 8th standard or something like that so I read that and i think after that i pretty much <laughs> decided that i have to do something or the other in space uh, so yeah that's that's basically how it started and so like did you know uh, by the time you were like you know 15 or so that you want to do an aeronautical engineering or something equivalent or did you have dreams of uh, going to the us and working at nasa or you know like w- what what kind of dreams did you have by by the time you were of that age oh a uh, very interesting question so i had no idea what i should be doing even though i loved space right and everything about space uh, uh, but i didn't know really what i should be doing for a profession as such 
right I, at least at that time it seemed very different things oh you love physics and aerospace but okay what what job are you going to do <laughs> those two seemed like very different questions uh, and when i was in 10th standard there was this competition called red rover goes to mars and uh, that was actually conducted by nasa i think with isro and they were actually having a few uh, people below 15 years of age actually participate in designing a, like you know a systems level design of a rover that will be in mars by 2019 or so uh, so i got selected in that one as a national semi finalist i actually had an opportunity to go to isro that was my first actual experience of visiting isro and all this was in 2000 uh so all that was happening so yes there were things about like going to mars and all those dreams in me uh but at the same time there were a lot of reality checks happening on the you know on the personal front <laughs> like really uh, what kind of a job are you going to get if you if you if you are not able to get into isro then pretty much you don't have any career for you and all those things are also coming from a lot of people around so i decided that probably a safer route is okay and i actually just liked all aspects of engineering it was not space was definitely at the top uh, favorite but it's not like only favorite so the next favorite thing for me was electronics actually so and that is where i uh, you know uh, that was uh, that is where i actually ended up doing a bachelor's in electrical and electronics engineering from college of engineering gandhi in chennai i wanted to do aerospace but then It, it it felt okay to actually keep these two separate i love physics but I, i mean i love aerospace but i can do something in electronics it seemed okay it didn't seem like a big thing at that point but that's how the story started so gindi is in chennai or uh, how far is it yes yes yeah, yeah it's in chennai it's in chennai I, i it was i was a day scholar not a hostel hmm. yeah, okay okay so what was uh, the the placement seemed like like by the end of your btech did you have more clarity on what you want to do and like a you know uh, like a more practical approach towards life that i need to get a job and start earning and get my head out of the stars so to say <laughs> practical approach yeah okay <laughs> we could call it that uh, interesting choice of words so anyway uh, so yeah i think two things happened one thing i was very clear was that i didn't want to directly get into uh any job i wanted to at least make it uh, feel like okay i've studied something for four years and i should do something in that and i actually liked what i was studying it is not like i you know completely i was i got into engineering because i had no clue what else to do right so it is so i liked that so i was very uh, you know careful about being applying only for like electrical uh, engineering oriented jobs or electronics oriented jobs then got into abb uh you know the uh, the uh, uh, i think swedish company right they make like these large electrical appliances and stuff so got in there and actually I was doing motor design and drive design and all that stuff uh, for like motors that used uh, that are used in huge industries like i remember actually working on a controller for a motor which was uh, turning the blast furnaces in steel plants in india in bokaro steel plant actually so fascinating stuff i never uh, have seen actually a motor tilt a furnace full of molten iron it's really awesome to see it if you have not seen so that is what i was doing but i also felt like the design part of it which is what i thought was you know my passion uh, there or my interest there was not really getting satisfied because these things were already well designed i was doing the last bit of fine tuning and you know uh, more like you know last bit documentation of documentation and yeah wouldn't say documentation it was more like service or fine tuning right so someone designs a drive but then you need to make it work for that motor in that application in that environment which is more like adapting it to that it didn't feel challenging enough uh, to me at that point so and then you know everyone has this group of friends that uh, he or she hangs out with when they're in college and for me everyone in my it just so happened that everyone in my close group actually was ended up doing something in finance at that point they were either doing you know cat and going for like an mba somewhere or people they, they were getting placed in investment banks directly so and i was a complete uh, beginner in that area i had no idea of what is finance in the sense i just knew <laughs> that there is something called balance sheet but even that i didn't really know what has to be done there and all that stuff so i was very intrigued actually by this whole area and this two years uh, if doing this kind of a role also kind of made me feel like hey this is this what engineering is i mean it's not less 
fascinating as it sounds and so i actually desired i should really go and take a look at finance because literally everyone around me was doing something in finance in that at that time so that's when i quit that job at abb and then went for a masters program in financial engineering i don't know if you heard of that course financial engineering it's actually uh, a branch of engineering which takes all of the, a lot of sophisticated models from physics and applies it to stock markets okay uh, so you talk about uh, things that probably quantum mechanics folks would talk about Uh, but you apply to stock markets, and it's amazing because both of these are unpredictable. <laughs> you might have heard of quantum uh, stuff being unpredictable, right? So they try to apply the same thing to stock markets, which uh, is called as quant trading. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The outcome of that is quant trading. Yes, yes, that's right. Quant is the quantitative part of that trading. Yes, yes, yes. So, ah, uh, so that is a course I got an admit in, and this was two thousand eight. so and it was in new york and i mean i had not gone i had not gone outside the country before that and it, i was how, how did you uh, afford this because i mean you're from a middle income family you know like uh, going studying in new york sounds expensive yeah yeah it was a one year course and uh, and i pretty much asked around all relatives i could <laughs> and without being too uh, ashamed of it and i also uh you know was able to make make some loans uh, take some loans so yeah some hybrid between all this i was able to work it out also the the promise was very clear how you can you're going to new york uh in a finance course i mean seriously you can repay any loan in uh, within 6 months <laughs> that was the pitch i was getting right so i was like yeah okay just a small investment for a long term return so I went, uh, but it was two thousand eight, and uh, as I told you before, I didn't know anything about finance, and I didn't know that there was one of the biggest crises in the you know entire history of finance brewing at that point. <laughs> Little did I know right? that was what is lurking behind. So I went in two thousand eight June to New York, and I realized that every week that passed by, there was one less. company to apply to for a job <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and, uh, so so all of the things that i had so and i don't know if you know this but uh, but 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 when in movies when you see new york there is a bias to show the midtown part of new york the wall street part of new york there is a lot of new york that is outside of this right and uh, i actually because and i went to columbia university actually i got an admit in columbia so i went there and that was basically the borderline of where things start to change in terms of appearances like that is that is not the new york that people show you in films <laughs> so that's when i realized okay reality is actually slightly gray <laughs> uh, and uh, and also the professional part of it was quite bad because they were because already people were getting fired and you know and things were really bad only people with some finance background were getting jobs because no company wanted to invest in a person to train them from him or her from scratch but then uh, one good thing that was happening is because so many uh, you know people were losing money left right center i mean in a, from a company standpoint a lot of risk management firms were hiring and financial engineering was the in thing at that time it was actually one of the things that caused the crisis if you have seen uh, movies like uh, as i forgot the name now but uh, the the one that they call yeah margin call is a good example there's also this other movie which is a little more uh, funny right the margin call is a very serious movie uh, anyway uh, anyway so so uh, there was there was still this belief in using financial engineers to hedge risk so that is where i came in uh, so bankruptcy firms were hiring risk management firms were hiring i got into risk management uh of uh, a company called axa you might have seen bharti axa here in india right so so that's where i got in i was called in to take care of the portfolio risk that comes in from uh you know the, so insurance premiums come in and people actually invested somewhere and that's how they return uh you know uh, whatever uh, schemes you have gotten into with the insurance company uh so that money has to be managed and they were losing a lot of money in that management at that time because the stock market was really bad and i had to come in to be part of a team that was hedging that risk out so that is where my finance career started 
So uh, AXA is a insurance company like any insurance company in India, like say uh, ICICI, Prudential, or it's like that only. Or yeah, yeah, it is like that only. But the, they offer a very complex financial products. So they there are products uh, which are focused on retirement benefits. Meaning, say for example, for the next twenty years of your life, if you pay say thousand dollars every month, then after you retire, you're guaranteed ten thousand dollars every every month. something like that right like they do that investment for you so those kind of i think we have similar products here with an indian hmm. yeah like this is called a pension plan yeah 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 it's about pension plans and coming up with annuities for that and so on yes so that's what i was that's what i started off in finance with yeah. yeah. so okay so uh, you know I, i'm going to dig a little deeper here so this like uh, axa collects money from people who are currently earning and putting away for old old age and it invests that money in the stock market and that is how it gives them back much more money when they retire and your job was to protect the value of that investment precisely that's actually a, yeah they don't do it only in stock market they do it in a bunch of vehicles right stock market is one of them they also do it in bonds they do it in you know more like they also put some money in hedge funds and so on so they diversify their portfolio so yeah and i came in to to make sure that they don't like how would you protect it tell me the tools that that are available okay uh so the, i i thought we'll, we'll, we'll be talking more about aerospace but anyway <laughs> i did this for 6 years so definitely i can talk about that so like uh, i told you you know i'm going to let my curiosity guide me so <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. No, this is fun. Uh, yeah. So the way we do it is, uh, so people usually have a portfolio allocation, you know, framework, right? And they use models to say where money should be. But then there are certain well-identified risks that come and say, for example, with whatever portfolio you are in, you can always come up with what people call Greeks. If you're aware of that uh, term, no. Basically, no, okay. Basically, it means that okay, you put say you have hundred rupees and you put forty rupees in stocks and. Sixty rupees in bonds, and then tomorrow the uh, the Nifty or whatever Sensex moves up and down by one percent, you're going to lose this much percentage of your hundred rupees. So that is called the sensitivity of the hundred rupees to that market change, right? So that's called a Greek, basically. A Greek, as in I think it's coming from a der- the the mathematical concept of a derivative. Basically, you, this ch- uh, what will be uh, for a small change in your Sensex, what is the, your portfolio going to take as a hit? so i come in and say hey this is what the greek for this portfolio is and by the way there are some interesting financial products available wherein if we buy that then it sort of acts like a uh, hedge wherein if i'm supposed to lose 1% uh, i won't lose at 1% i'll only lose 0.01 because i bought this extra instrument hmm. and th- those instruments would be like uh, what like say short selling related stuff those would be like uh, call options or put options basically <clears throat> so you if you use particularly if you want to protect your uh, you know portfolio's worth from going down when there is a market down a uh, stock market down you will probably buy a put option on that put on these w- what is a call put- option and a put option i mean you know i studied all this stuff like 20 years back in my mba i have completely forgotten it uh, but okay so a call option is uh, basically like uh, you know you basic you entering into a contract with someone who says who, and, and you're betting with them saying that hey if the market if the if the if the market goes up beyond this certain money i will still be able to buy the buy the stock from you at a lower price so you basically it's betting on things going bad getting better and a put option is actually the reverse you get basically buying I will be uh, let's able say to sell you yeah, at a higher it. price exactly even if the market goes lower so basically what we do to hedge out stock market risk is you find out how sensitive you are to the market from your portfolio and you end up buying a portfolio of options you say i'll buy a little bit of calls i'll buy some puts and then make sure that if my market moves my stocks will lose money but my options will gain in their worth and so i'm net net okay So that's basically what I was doing. Okay, so this is exactly what financial engineering is. It was one aspect of financial engineering. One aspect yes. of it. Okay, okay. So and and I imagine like small stuff that you would do would lead to big revenue impact. Yeah, yeah. There was a lot of. I mean, I got really lucky in that uh, uh, that sense. 
because the team I was working in was managing billions of dollars of derivatives uh, or all these options, right? Uh, the the more the finance jargon for that is derivatives, right? So derivatives and uh, and I was literally sitting there day in and day out. It's like a, it was like a trading floor. So every day <laughs> there'll be all these staggering numbers. Of oh my god we gained this much oh my god we just we we didn't lose this much and all these things, so it was very very uh, you know de- uh, uh, hands on in terms of impacting the bottom line of the company that team particularly. So yes, so that that gave me a lot of satisfaction the initial period at AXA, because I knew that what I was developing models for or what decisions we were making, uh, would directly save the company money. and that was a very uh, you know uh, very satisfying feeling for some time hmm. was it very much like a boiler room kind of a like you know uh, people with three or four monitors in front of them and yeah uh, yeah i had four monitors okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it was not oh, wow. that it was not like the trading floor you would see in a movie kind of a thing because there not like so many people out there it was not like a say morgan stanley trading floor or goldman sachs trading floor right because it's not like we had hundreds of people doing this uh, we had like some 10 people or 20 people doing it and that area used to look like that yes and we were so market uh, driven like we we live in uh, die by what the market does right basically uh, until 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 uh, 6 pm new york time basically 6 pm new york time is where nothing happens and then there is this half an hour before tokyo wakes up and starts market starts so the 6 to 6:30 is when you really get your you know your 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 free time after that again you have to watch out for japan exposure and yeah. after japan it comes india then comes europe then again back to us so that's it used to be around that clock and uh, friday evenings were great because friday evening 6 o'clock was amazing that is the time when literally no market in the world was open <laughs> till sunday night time yeah. so i've been so for a very long time my weekends always ended at sunday night time because japan opens by then a new york times sunday 9 pm mc yeah so, got it mm. okay so you must have been working with like you know the the top 1% of the smartest people in the world kind of a thing there oh yeah yeah that was that was uh, <laughs> that I, i again i consider myself lucky today that you know i met some amazing people uh, both in my course at uh, columbia university and after that at axa as well i i still actually uh, you know it's used some of the things that i learned from them but uh, that's easy to say now at that time it was soul crushing because i just I, because i mean i i was okay academically uh, all along my school years and college and all that right i mean i was not like a topper topper but within let's say the top 5 top 6 always like academics was never like a problem for me so i is always uh, sort of this okay performer and so i had this image about you know okay i'm 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 fine <laughs> okay and then you go meet these people and you're like oh my god <laughs> Ouch. okay i have to now basically self i have to basically rewrite my image of who i am <laughs> so that's, a, that's a little scary but it was actually it also i think happened at the right time because it is at a time where you're okay at least for me around this those early 20s right that is when my personality was also i think my opinion of myself was getting formed properly <laughs> it got rooted in the right kind of reality <laughs> because i met some really awesome people and i realized oh my god okay i need to find what is there in me that i am different from them in the some other skills that they are really really good at so yes but it must have been like you know the, the way a diamond gets polished you know that, that kind of a high uh, high performance environment with very very competitive peers yeah i mean see actually i it is right i don't know about the diamond part and all but uh, people were very nice uh, i again i'm lucky there right i obviously uh, uh, you know it just happened that people around me were not nasty they were not like you know there was no corporate bullshit and none of that stuff but it just the kind of value that they were bringing on with the kind of amount of hours of work they were putting in and what i was doing was like <laughs> not comparable in some sense like I mean, i'm like struggling to get this code to work for like 6 hours and that day just finished it in like 2 hours and i actually it runs faster than my code what am i doing i you know so that kind of feeling right so it was it was pressure it it was not pressure to 
12 but sample. why were you writing code was it to run simulations or what what was the code for code was for multiple things one is to run simulations so what the if the market does a certain thing what the portfolio would do it was also for like building trading tools uh, so we had to figure out ways where we had to all these rules of thumb right i i i basically one thing if i learned from finances the the amazing thing about rules of thumb right like they finance is full of shortcuts and all these really interesting shortcuts wherein it don't tell you exactly what will happen but it really give you a good idea of what's going what 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 to predict what what are they give me some examples of rules of thumb no rules of thumb as in like say for example even this whole greek thing i told you about right what will happen to your portfolio if there's a change in the market and if one person market change happens right that's a first cut approximation of your value erosion or value creation similarly there are all these metrics i remember uh, i used to work for the head of trading there and their questions used to always come like okay tomorrow if the uh, so in new york it was s&p 500 right that is their market index so tomorrow the s&p 500 moves by 5% and the nikkei the japan one right nikkei moves down by 2% what will happen to the portfolio and you had to come up with so if you are not really thinking of how to answer these questions your sunday is ruined so we used to come with all sorts of shortcuts to what is the quickest and you know it could be dirty and it could be like dirty in the sense like very simplistic but what is the quickest way to estimate something it always question like okay tomorrow market crashes by 20% what will happen to the portfolio hmm. so essentially it it honed your ability to take decisions with a, a, a lot of data which you may not necessarily be able to register all of it but you were able to like absorb the data and take decisions yeah yeah it it made me think of like uh, it made me come up with uh, systems wherein even though there is a ton of information to process always the answer has to be in 10 seconds hmm hmm wow that's an amazing skill to have hmm. <laughs> if you if you if you heard of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, people generally traders not having patience it's very true right uh, so And so they don't and they just move on if you if you get asked a question and you don't answer in 10 seconds they move on and it will make me, at least me make, make me feel very bad because it just felt like god why am i not able to answer the question <laughs> right so what i ended up doing is like particularly on fridays and before going home and all these lean times right i used to just come up with all these small small rules of thumb for myself so and all these numbers there are like hundreds of numbers each excel sheet is like you know one one mega by one mb two mb but doesn't matter what matters is can you answer that question in 5 seconds so that actually made me abstract away a lot of useless information it taught me how to do that and i actually still find that very useful and it is very interestingly we have i i because probably of my finance years today for rocket building which is what we do we have a raw lot of rules of thumb and i have been telling the team to work on that so anyway that's a, for a different part of the chat anyway. so, like moving on from axa like did you like make the switch for more money when you joined aig or was it for a different portfolio or what was the thing oh uh, no i think so i was working in axa i was doing this i loved it i learned a lot but i my I was an engineer at heart. I think I my 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 dream for space never really went away. Uh so I decided that I should just go quit all this and go to aerospace because that is really what will give me fulfillment. But at the same time I was also actually already starting to doubt what am I doing because I already changed once from electrical to finance. Now I'm going back from finance to some engineering. Is this just a you know a me just being impatient with things or is it really something that is my calling i had no idea hmm. so, was it a elon musk effect like you know uh, that to to even think that you can uh, leave a job in finance and do something in space i mean you know i say uh, two decades back it would have been like unbelievable to hear somebody thinking like that but you know people like elon musk have made it possible to think like that yeah it was definitely that part as well uh, i would uh, i mean that was a reason why i took up a job in la right i wanted to be around spacex but uh, at the same time i think what was also happening is i was simply getting really restless with my professional work 
and i felt like i cannot continue on like this right i had to give it a shot so that was there of course that was the time when you know uh, we rocket launches started becoming a big deal in the us and you know we we had this biography of uh, uh, musk come out and then at the same time we had the steve jobs sort of biography you know by order of writing biography came out at that time so all these books also shaped my ability to take risk right but this restlessness was there uh constantly which is why i actually I also because a lot of people started telling me around me that you know i might be confused and the feedback i heard is hey you know what maybe just live with this for some time you will get used to it it's not that hard i mean a lot of people would you know would be really long to be in the place where you are in today you are in new york in finance it doesn't get better than this right and i was and i was in front office as well right so meaning very close to where uh trading is or in the trading floor itself so that is like as good as it gets in finance basically right that is where you pick after that is that is the that is the dream to be in to become the ceo or something like that that is where people raise up the ranks in that range so that was there so i actually that's when i ended up doing a lot of other things because i really wanted to understand who i am as a person okay that's when you got into making films Yeah, yeah yeah that's where i that's where my 3 years of part time film making school happened and I, i really just want to understand like what am i good at because as i told, as you also rightly asked how was it working with really talented people right it basically question makes you question what you think about yourself but then you do realize there is something in you that will work you just have to find that <laughs> it might not be what you thought it is it's something else right so and for all that it just experimenting generally helps so that's where and i always loved films i don't know when that interest exactly started but i think i have always been very curious about how films get made uh basically the concept of storytelling always fascinated me so so that's where that also came in so yeah film school is there and then film school actually helped me make it very clear that i was not cut out for finance <laughs> so uh, so a lot of those revelations happened then i basically quit my job and registered for a masters in aerospace engineering from uh, the university of illinois at urbana champaign uiuc uh, and yeah and that happened but that was in the middle of nowhere as far as aerospace engineering is concerned it was it was in some part of illinois <laughs> nothing really was happening around there and us particularly if you know like this it is so geography focused right if you want to be in uh, electronics or software you probably better off in the valley area. Huh? exactly right and similarly if you are in finance if you want to be in finance you are either in chicago or in new york right so and similarly in illinois nothing was there for aerospace directly and that is where the feeling came okay i need to be around space and that is what drove me to la uh, and i i was on a visa i needed a job i can't just be a, i had to either be a full time student or i have to be a full time job otherwise i can't be in the us so that's where the aig came in because aig they were very similar role to what i did at axa was also open at aig and it happened to be in an la location and uh, so you did both like you you joined aig and you also pursued the i converted this to my part time yeah i converted this to a part time course like a evening course basically and it was done online and once in a while i had to visit the university and stuff but it was more like vacational stuff so yeah and working finance from los angeles is really interesting because your day starts at 6 and it ends at 3:30 Ah, okay. So it gave you the time to uh, study and like after your day was. Yeah. Hmm. So usually people go to bed early, but I didn't do that. <laughs> so I was able to meet a lot of people and 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 network and understand what what is this sector that I'm so fascinated about. How is the reality of that sector? And and being in LA definitely helped because I was meeting so many people who are first of all so. encouraged by spacex and i'm i happened to meet a few people from spacex which actually was like big wow moments for me uh oh okay that is <laughs> these are the people who work there kind of a feeling right so all that happened and, and yeah slowly got used to what this whole sector is about 
If you like to hear stories of founders, then we have tons of great stories from entrepreneurs who have built billion dollar businesses. Just search for the Founder Thesis Podcast on any audio streaming app like Spotify, Ghana, Apple Podcasts and subscribe to the show. So, uh, when did you then decide to quit AIG and do space full time? Well, I, that was very clear from the time I quit uh, my New York job itself, actually, right? In the sense, it had to be space full time. I just didn't know how to get there. And in between two things happened. One, I knew always that I wanted to come back to India at some point. Uh, I also was going to get married around that time, around 2017. So that is also what was happening. So you met someone in the US or uh, this was in India? I came for, uh, I mean, I, I met the person uh, remotely online, but then I actually met her. Mm-hmm. Like your, your parents? No, no, no. It was not, it was, it was not a arranged kind of marriage. It was more like through some common networks and stuff. A random LinkedIn thing, I think. If I remember. LinkedIn, wow. <laughs> <laughs> not, not very often you get to hear about people like, you know, getting married through a LinkedIn connection. <laughs> No, it was, I, yeah, it was, it was like some common community, I think, uh, of some uh, Ivy League folks or something like that. So from there it started. Then I met and her. She was in working in India. Yeah, yeah. She had, she had been to the US and then she had returned. So, so you had that value system match there in the sense that you also wanted to come back to India after working in the US. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So that's how that started. Uh, so I was also looking to come to India for, you know, because of this, right, this was also moving. And also the other thing is uh, being an Indian citizen doing aerospace stuff in a uh, foreign country, not necessarily US. Any country is a little hard because it could be construed as technology, which is dual use. And there are a lot of clearances that you need to go through. And it takes the, and it is doable, right? It's definitely doable. The question is, it takes the focus away from technology and puts it on paperwork. And then you're running around solving these paperwork issues as opposed to closing out technology. So, so that is why I decided India is probably a better place. And one thing that totally caught me by surprise is the respect that ISRO has in the US. Uh, that I at least no one had told me about it. Uh, but uh, but but when I used to go meet people and tell them that hey I'm from India and if I mention something about ISRO, immediately people it was almost like they took me seriously just because of ISRO and I had nothing to do with ISRO at that time. So I realized that actually India is doing really well. Okay, but was it like a? Uh... You know, um, for example, people from IIT are highly respected, but if you look at, say, the number of research papers and patents that IITs file, they are like much lower than comparable organizations around the world. So was it something similar where somebody who's worked in ISRO then come to the US and therefore has built respect for the ISRO brand? Or was it like ISRO was doing groundbreaking stuff which people were taking notice of? Yeah, it was more of the latter. ISRO was really doing groundbreaking stuff that no one had done at that time. And people was, I think people are actually not only it's, it continues that, you know, how is ISRO able to pull it off at these kind of cap, uh, capital cost expenditures, right? I mean, we are one of the most affordable space programs in the entire world. So, so that is fascinating, right? And and I think it's important to keep money in mind because it's not available easily, even at a government level. And you're talking um, hundreds of millions of dollars being reduced to, you know, say double digit million dollars, right? So uh, order of magnitude changes and doing successful missions. So that had like, so the Mars missions, the, the way in which we did, I think in 2016 actually was the time when there was that 104 satellite launch of ISRO that happened. And at that time, we were the uh, we were the only country in the world that had uh, launched the highest number of satellites in one launch. So all that was already happening, right? And so and and some of the technology that we have uh, accomplished, in particularly in rockets uh, for you know commercial satellites. 
i think is on par with what anyone else has done so uh, so so there was so much respect for that part and that's when i realized actually it's not like a bad thing it's actually probably a good thing to go to india and do it because the rest of the world is actually very curious about how india is able to pull this off so i saw that respect in there uh, and and rocket launchers particularly are very very uh, it's like it's it's like a rocket launcher is a little bit like uh, music composed by an artist right like anyone can e- even if you're not a musician you get to judge it <laughs> right? and i i i can go and coolly talk about ai yeah, ramon song saying yeah that was not really cool even though i can't compose anything even one note of it right and so i found that very fascinating about because in other products you don't get to get to you don't get to do that right like if say for example you're writing a software product for some company and you have a big bug right so probably your boss is going to be pissed off and probably your customer you're going to lose that customer probably some 25 people in that network will know and that's about it a rocket launch fails uh, tomorrow your neighbor will ask you what happened <laughs> Yeah, uh, the whole world knows right <laughs> so it is very public you're putting your work out there and at, and and doing that is sort of and gain so much credibility right so that is where i think the credibility factor comes being able to put technology out there for the entire world to judge and still getting things right so so that's 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 what basically told me that india is not a bad option in fact i soon realized it is actually the best option did you like build a corpus uh, like save up a corpus to bootstrap it or you know like uh, did you like first start by looking for funding how did you identify that what you want to do because i mean space is such a broad uh, domain you know so within that how did you identify what you want to do like like tell me about that journey you know from from a vague itch to something which actually existed oh uh yeah so there actually the rocket squad was very clear i think i grew up watching do darshan launches of pslv so that fascination was always there then of course going to the us and seeing you know spacex attempt reusable rockets that was also there and then when i did my own networking that i told you about when i was in la uh every one i met um in fact from a university i, I think i went to about 25 30 universities in the southern california area right starting from small community colleges all the way to like really good ones uh, in terms of their ranking i went to everything and all of them i think had some small satellite sitting in a lab and i, I really wondered why are they not in space satellite is not supposed to be <laughs> in a lab right so uh, and i used to ask the same question actually to people and everyone was complaining about like you know they were not getting the right kind of vehicle to go to space and and it was not easy to combine with the rest of the people who wanted to go the orbit they wanted to go to is not where the rocket was going all sorts of logistic problems so that's why i came up with a small thought that okay actually you should build a really really small rocket that really quickly takes small satellites and quickly puts it in space like all this quickly <laughs> this feeling of quickly was there in my head from that time because people are suffering from more delay so it like, should just be a quick small rocket to quickly launch things in space and quickly come back and that's it and uh, a reusable rocket <clears throat> a reusable or not was actually i was not very focused on that part of it but it was more like okay if you want to go to space just you should be able to go to space it's not like it should not be like so complex some logistics and because it's not like technology was not there we are already been launching rockets from 60s right but then still people are stuck with satellites and in so many labs so that is so where in this... a way you you were like looking at the uberization like on demand sending to space yeah yeah it was very much on demand sending to space i really felt like if someone like for example uh you know wanted to put something uh in space for uh, his or her son's birthday or something it should not be like oh my god you need to be an i like you know you need to be a jeff bezos for that it should not be that hard right as long as yeah it keep it will be expensive yes but it should not be like only the top 10 per, top 1% of the richest people in the world should be able to do that so that's why it started and yeah i mean after that i called called a bunch of by this time actually my other co-founder his name is mohan 
uh he he was also sort of in the middle of a career change and stuff he was actually he did his bachelor's in aerospace and then he was actually fascinated by space law uh, he's like this he really tries to examine why exactly you know things are right what is right what is wrong all those kind of existential questions right because it's very hard if you think of it actually how did we come up with a system to say you are right and i am wrong right and you can endlessly debate that but we still have a system that meaningfully functions if not perfect still meaningfully functions so he was interested about the space aspect of it so stuff like who does space belong to now if you end up building a city on mars now is that city uh you know some american companies or is it americas or whose is it right and all of those things so he was there and he was also uh running some sort of a contract manufacturing company in chennai because his his parents his dad was not well and he had to run that because of a family situation he had stabilized that and he was also looking to do something in aerospace which is when i told him about my own you know plunge into aerospace and so it seemed like a natural way for him to also get come in and that's how he joined the journey and we both so actually co- yeah this uh, w- like w- what's the timeline here like you joined aig 16 yeah 2016 and uh, i told the moen around middle of like somewhere around later part of 2016 okay okay so th- those two years you spent at aig you were also uh, in parallel setting the ground to uh, launch agnikol yeah 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 yes exactly i was doing a lot of work to understand what it means i was beginner to startups no one in my family had done any entrepreneurship as such uh and yeah space was new <laughs> everything was new so <laughs> had to do a lot of ground work to understand what it means to do this right so yeah hmm. that is what that so, is so, tell me about that uh, two year journey then like like so you first you found a person who could be a potential co-founder then what next oh no that came much later because moin was uh, doing told me that during the later part of 2016 or early 2017 actually even though we were talking right that was not the first thing first thing for me was to uh, so i this is where my finance experience came in i knew what it mean to go and talk to someone about <laughs> a business right uh, and i tried to always ask this question hey if i had to go and pitch this to elon musk what would he say right like simply uh, that was a question i used to ask myself because uh, i wanted to see how an expert would look at it right so i try to come up with the business case i try to understand what truly does it mean to build a small rocket did the market survey for other small rockets out there uh, understood if there is really a business you can make out of it all the questions that led on investors started grilling me on right that is what i was forming the framework for and at the same time all the startup jargon which at least now is seeming very normal to me but at that time it was completely like okay what does it mean to say seed round what is pre series a <laughs> what is series a how do you raise money what's valuation all those things uh, from a core finance standpoint it was easy to understand but i didn't know the jargon in the industry here so that kind of work was what was happening for a long time and then once moin came in and also it was uh, around i think it was like these things lined up i was actually cha- so uh, uh, my fiance then uh, my wife now she had come to visit me i think in 2016 december uh, during the christmas time there right and at that time uh, i was just asking i mean i was just talking to her about some random thing and then she suddenly told me about one person on uh, twitter in in chennai about doing something on aerospace and then uh, i reached out to him and he actually connected me to someone who is a part of the iid madras community and then he connected me to someone who is a part of a particular facility within iid madras and that person connected me to professor satya chakravarti who now is a co-founder of me right so that's literally how it started because i was doing a lot of cold calling with moin because i was very clear that this have to be an, a, a university affiliation has to be there because i didn't have that kind of money to you know it was not a paypal to spacex story right i didn't i didn't just my wall street years were not that 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 luxurious okay so so it's not like i had that kind of money so i knew i need an academic partner for labs for infrastructure for guidance for access to people to work with those things were very clear from the very beginning 
and i was also like i was also seeing those success stories in the us when i was doing my own networking so that's where things started and then i cold called so many profs i mean moin and i i think we wrote to about 70 80 iit professors across the country uh kanpur karakpur delhi bombay any 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 meaningful iit at least in terms of an aerospace engineering team right i we wrote but uh i fully saw from their perspective this was just a bunch of people who had no idea what to do and they were reaching out <laughs> trying to see whether they can build rockets so they would have most likely flagged us as spam which i might have done today if i were in their shoes right who knows but so again not complaining just saying that's how it happened but then one person for some reason this person right who who I met through these four levels of four degrees of separation he actually happened to give me a meeting a video meeting and then i pitched what was not agnikul at that time but some version of agnikul at that time and he actually was like yeah this is not a bad idea i myself have thought about building rockets in a few interesting ways maybe we should continue talk and that day i decided okay i should start looking for one way tickets to chennai so that's 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 how the story started <laughs> basically of 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 coming back see the lucky thing is that it happened in chennai who knows right like i was i, I didn't care about chennai at that point uh it from la bombay and chennai are close enough <laughs> right so i was just like something you should do in india you should figure it out maybe bangalore who knows but yeah it just happened again i think as i've already told you so many times so many things fell in place uh, along whatever i've done so far i think this is another thing meeting prof yeah, yeah once he showed the slightest amount of interest uh, it was very clear that i should pack and that's in december actually i came to chennai for good in october 2017 and uh, by december 2017 we formally incorporated our and uh, he was a like part of the founding team or he joined a little later like professor uh, professor chakravarti uh. yeah no he was part of the founding team very much uh, yeah very very much part of the founding team he was a person who told us what can be done what cannot be done i mean he is a rocket scientist himself and uh, it's like uh, he could at least tell us you know how the system functions here and he sits on a lot of isro committee reviews and all that stuff himself so he had a lot of you know uh, connections there more importantly he also actually uh, new people who he connected us to in fact he is a person who connected us with uh, mr rv perumal who is actually the father of india's dslv rocket so and he he was the first person we pitched to it was my first pitching meeting with a scientist and i was super <laughs> nervous and probably now <laughs> i still have the presentation of course and it looks very stupid to me now but anyway <laughs> for your old story what, what what was the what was the pitch that you were making no for agnikul only right but what the rocket should be like and all that because i had my own notions of why why it, what does it mean to build a on demand rocket obviously at that time it was very crude but two or three things i luckily got right was first uh, the core business case right that has never changed a lot of things have changed since 2017 but the core business case never changed so that i'm very thankful for that i got that right early on second i think the kind of people i met starting from moin also to uh, prof and then through prof uh, mr perumal i think all these people i mean i could not have asked for a better group of people to start the company with right so that fell in place product is product right product keeps evolving all the time so that's different but but these things somehow fell in place and yeah that's how we started so agnikul was incorporated uh in chennai i think the date was december 1st 2017 that is the date of hmm, hmm. okay and uh, like uh, uh, initially you did not need funding because of the iit madras uh, incubation like they were giving you labs and people who would work with you and infrastructure and stuff like that yeah yeah something like that yes but uh, i mean so so three things helped us in very 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 uh, the beginning very few year months right one is both moin and i had worked before so there were some savings that we could put it uh, right and then second yes you exactly said uh being in an academic institution helps starting from cheaper food <laughs> all the way to the right kind of access to people in mean, all these small things that count for me it was a very humbling experience because i like i told you right we were managing portfolios worth millions and all billions all these big big 10 power 9 kind of numbers but then again i was here 
like okay i see today i can have gone have food here because it was really also uh, unsettling because we didn't know what's going to happen right so but being in always makes me feel good to be in a university setting uh, so uh, always feels like there is so much hope and so much more to do from a university setting so i loved the part that you know i was able to get into and meet someone from id madras and id madras was supporting so yes so it was not that bad uh, third thing also was that prof himself had students that he was working with who he could you know tell hey why don't you just go and talk to shrinath for some time kind of a thing where i got some free help as well so all that was helping us you know slowly get started yeah that's that's how we went about it the initial phase so who who was your first external investors like uh, our first major external investors so first major external investor was uh, uh, vishesh uh, he is from a fund called special uh, and and you know what happened is i ended up so i was very new to the startup community here and in the 10 years that i was not in india all my friends who were with me who were in startups they are all like become founders and everyone knew a lot of people right so i met a lot of funds at that time through them uh, uh so because by then people who stayed in india they you know it, this was like when i was 31 32 so by then actually you can imagine right people are already in a certain place in their career by that time uh so met a lot of people but space tech as a business was too 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 foreign as an idea for most vcs in the country at that time and most of them used to think I, i mean again i won't blame any of them right because it's the context it's just a guy who's coming from the us here and he wants to build rockets like what are you talking about right uh but then there was this one fund by name special in chennai actually uh out of and because all of the pitching used to be in bangalore 95% of the time and i met someone in chennai through a tai chennai event at id madras incubation cell and he seemed to understand this stuff and i was very like surprised by that fact that because i didn't know that they actually had a view on space tech that was very early at that time this was 2018 june i'm talking about so then that's about it then once that started uh, so once vishesh and his team were interested in us slowly we got Uh, used to what it means to work with a VC, and Vishesh is definitely one of the most founder friendly VCs that I've met. So that made it easy, but he was the first person to put serious money in the company. So they invested half a million. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. And uh, like you know, what did you use this money for? Tell me about that product evolution. Oh yeah. So first, this is again very clear to us because we had uh, people like uh, Mr. Perumal, Professor Satya. All these people were like. you know very clearly telling us what has to be done right the, the framework for the development was very clear it has it was more on the execution and the innovation part so yeah the first thing was about building out engines uh, engines basically the way you build any any vehicle in for space right it could be a space craft it could be a satellite it could be a rocket you basically get the engine right and what a, because you can't play with the engine too much like what you do a lot of things and finally you get an engine and you start with it and then the rest of the rocket is built around the engine that's how it goes and this is the standard in the industry as well so we, that's where we started you had to first get the engine right uh, and so you know we got the engine part done uh, uh been multiple tests happened and then after that uh, i think by 2018 september we were able to do a successful firing and this was a conventionally manufactured rocket engine meaning it was not in no 3d printing nothing of that sort was happening then and after that we were able to uh, so what does it mean successful firing like did you actually build the whole rocket and then fire it or what what does that mean we like, built the engine and then we put it on a on a on a mount like you you know we basically harnessed it to the ground and then we just fired it as if it would be flying but it is not flying so because actually for a rocket to fly you need two things uh, you need a engine and you need autopilot basically those two these two things have to be working together to to get the to keep the vehicle stable and fly so this part was still in the engine stage so we just had to put it on the ground and fly uh, this, this you said uh, middle of 2018 is when you had this uh, successful firing of the engine first successful firing of the conventionally manufactured one 
but we always knew that we had a 3d printer rocket engines uh, and this was because uh, it was very clear that one of the slowest moving pieces in making a rocket is the rocket engine itself and we had to be you know we wanted to automate it to a point where there is no human intervention involved at all it should be like something just makes the engine and gives it to you and this is we're reading about other companies trying 3d printing for rocket engines and so on we just you know we're pushing the boundaries ever, ever so you know steadily so okay we made 20% of the engine 3d printed we made 40% 3d printed and then now it is 100% 3d printed and also you successfully test fire that so yeah lucky team has done extremely awesome uh you know a development there but that's basically like right. so this uh, fundraise of half a million dollars was also around the same time only middle of 2018 it was yeah around the end of 2018 yes. end of 2018 okay 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 so uh, what was 2019 like for you like what were the milestones in that like 18 you had these two milestones of uh, the fundraise and the successful test firing tell me about 19 19 was about scaling the team with this money that came in uh, also trying out this fully 3d printed engine right and also starting co- customer conversations you know we have to grow out of the lab basically right uh, that part of it where you you start looking at business aspects you start talking to customers you start talking to suppliers you start talking to isro all of those things started happening in 2019 Did you build the the rocket around the engine? Uh... Yeah, that is that was the, obviously that product is continuing and that is continuing to you know evolve, right? Uh, but I'm saying other than that, other than the vehicle development, a lot of other things also have to be done. So those things started by that time. Uh, like, how do you launch a rocket? Do you need a like a launch vehicle for that, or can you just put it on a ground somewhere and launch it? Like, uh, how does the launch happen? what all other things you need to do to actually get it off the ground oh okay so actually rocket and launch vehicles are synonymous terms at least the way i have used it here launch vehicle is what you refer to a, the more the right way to refer to a flying rocket is a launch vehicle basically so uh, it is launched from a launch pedestal basically that's the that's the phrase for the system that you are talking about uh, launch pedestal Uh, so what do you need to do so uh, it's like a car that is uh, uh, you know ready to go in a f1 <laughs> race or something right so basically you you get everything assembled ready you need to fuel it uh, you need to keep all of the programs that are needed for it uh, to fly in the right manner and then you fire the engines and let go that's basically the idea and the interesting part is every rocket that has ever flown to space has always been on autopilot in fact in my understanding autopilot as a theory itself developed from the need for launching rockets to space because things are happening so fast you can sit back and do any joystick control so uh, so next time if you actually end up watching a launch and you'll see a lot of these people up with in front of all these monitors right uh, all of them are just watching <laughs> Yeah, right. Yes, that's true. <laughs> so nothing can be done. You can basically just like wonder what's going on, or be happy about, or celebrate what's going on. But the concept is that you let go uh, and you wait and watch the fun. And not only you, uh, the rest of the world gets to judge it <laughs> with you. So in that sense alone, I still feel there is a small analogy to a film that can be made. Every rocket launch is like a film. It's a lot of money spent, and then you put it out there. Everyone can gets to judge it, and you can't really do much about it. Right, right. Hmm. Okay. So, yeah. In uh, in nineteen, did you actually launch a rocket also to space, or this was no, no. We have not launched anything to space so far. Hopefully, by uh, early next year, we'll be ready for that. Uh, so so far, we've been fine tuning, fine tuning. There's a lot of fine tuning that goes in because. uh you have very little margins when you're building a rocket uh from a mass standpoint right otherwise it doesn't get you all the way to orbit okay so you need to make it as light as possible so you're constantly looking at how to make it lighter yes 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 exactly right so you're constantly doing that you're fine tuning fine tuning fine tuning and, and usually it's not a first cut optimization that gets the job done you need to think of like some five things that all have to work together to get that reduction to be possible i can give you some example right there is there is an example of where you push out 
fuel and uh, to push out fuel into your rocket engine you need uh, something called a pressure end which actually pushes the fuel from the tank into the engine right now you obviously have to take that also with you correct but then to take that with you you end up storing it in a liquid phase basically because it liquid occupies lesser volume you can you can get by with smaller tanks the very reason that the pressure end can be used as a, and can be stored as a liquid is because the fuel is so so cold it is cryogenic oxygen and that's why you are able to hold the pressure now if the moment you lose the if the if the fuel starts to heat up you also lose your pressure so these kind of like interconnected optimizations are there so that is why the fine tuning takes a lot of time but but it's it's a very challenging experience to go through this basically there are a lot of moving parts and uh, everything needs to work like a symphony in a way yes 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 right and hey, the the question or the challenge i always tell my team is uh, all, we all know that all human beings have some imperfection in them uh, but we all have to come together and build a perfect product which i find is a fascinating challenge actually so because the passing grade is 100% as they say right there is no scope for failure no room for error you can't reset your a uh, rocket in mid flight it's not like a phone if it hangs uh, you know it's not like you can just reset it right so, right right mm-hmm. so you basically get mm-hmm. one shot and it has to work and literally thousands of things have to work and i find that as a very from a pure uh, so like you know human behavior standpoint i find it a very fascinating challenge how do a bunch of people who are all you know in some sense imperfect right come together and make a perfect product that's very that's a, that's a, that's the job of making rockets basically mm mm-hmm. that's a fascinating way to look at it so uh, do you have like uh, commitment from customers and do you have like a uh, i mean you know are the pieces falling in place you would need some sort of a launch platform facility are those available off the shelf and uh yeah you would obviously have needed more money also i'm sure that half a million dollar wouldn't have lasted too long so you know tell me about how these pieces are all falling into place yeah sure so uh it's all going quite well luckily uh, again so one thing that happened during 2020 so we spoke about 2019 some time ago uh 2020 the good thing that happened is we were able to raise the next round of money that was a pre series a that was about 3.5 million dollars and also the other thing is uh, right after that covid hit right and at that time is when uh, the government came out with this new uh, atmanirbhar policy right and there space got a free lift because they they came up with this new entity called in space which is going to be a parallel to isro just for authorization of private space programs so all of the thing that you're talking about in terms of a place to launch from and in terms of authorization to launch i think Uh, again being in the right place at the right time has helped us so we are able to do that now so in space is something like uh, try like you have try for private telecom companies like it takes care of the regulation and uh, disputes and uh, allocating the uh, the wavelength spectrum and all of that so is it something like that yeah, like what loosely is loosely like that yeah loosely it's an authorization uh, body yeah so loosely like that yes correct correct So yeah so that happened and at the same time we had some successful engine firing as i told you we raised a couple of rounds of money so customers also started taking us more seriously right and people also the team also started to grow so things are slowly falling in place uh, it's hardware hardware doesn't work uh, so <laughs> that's the norm so there is always you know you're constantly tinkering uh, right tinkering is the norm uh, uh, and you're constantly also fine tuning in the process but slowly the other pieces of the puzzle are falling in place definitely uh, you know i would say that now i i can see clear visibility on all areas from a customer standpoint from a launch mechanism standpoint from an authorization standpoint from a product standpoint in all these areas uh, very clear deliverables very clear goals because as a startup i think that's one thing to actually formulate is right you need clarity on the question the answers will anyway come you should know what questions to ask and those things should be in place first uh because otherwise it becomes so open ended and you don't know what you're trying to do and all that stuff so luckily we have gotten over those points so far hmm. okay so uh, uh 
like uh, you know you, you said something very interesting and uh, i want to kind of understand that a bit more that it's important to know what are the questions to ask rather than the answers because the answers come so uh, what do you think are the questions that an entrepreneur should uh, know like you know can, can you like talk a bit more about this Oh yeah, sure. So I think the first thing is what is a value addition, right? What does what is the real thing that you are bringing to the to the world? Uh, because you might think it's a problem, but it's probably not a large enough problem, or it's not a problem at all. So, are you actually solving a problem, or are you just doing something because you like? I think that's the first question, and it's a very hard question because you need to be able to brutally face yourself, uh, uh, you know, and ask that question. because there are always biases that we get into yeah yeah this will anyway happen yeah yeah there is a problem those things are always there right but to honestly get a third person's view and it's very tough also because there are a lot of skeptics around even if it's a genuine problem people don't sometimes acknowledge it not because they don't want to but because it's just it's just not easy sometimes right so you have to figure that part out first uh, what is the true problem that you're solving and what is the so whether your solution is actually going to help people help people enough to give you money right that is the that's a different level of a, a reassurance that you need for 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 the business the next thing is i think to create all the structures and put systems in place to keep things going first 10 people can do anything actually like it doesn't matter you don't need any system because you can literally talk to everyone every day But the moment you go to twenty-five, you need systems. The moment you go to sixty, seventy, you need really strong systems. Otherwise, you won't even know where inefficiencies are coming from, right? So that is the right set of questions that I'm talking about. Also, uh, questions about uh, what are each of these people going to uh, use to communicate effectively within each other? So, if you have like five teams, how are these teams going to talk? What is the language? Uh, I obviously, don't mean English alone, right? I mean the manner in which communication information flows within the company so these are things to solve for and ask as questions first now and once you once you ask these questions i think there are so many smart people around you and in the team that you will hire who can all solve it i always find the biggest value addition that i bring to agnikul also is in the questions i ask not from answers because there are much more smarter engineers than i i'm <laughs> it's like a little bit like my yoga experience i'm i'm talking to a lot of people who are 10x smarter than me uh, right in the design part but i think the value addition i bring in is by setting by giving them direction and asking the right questions mm 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 got it interesting so w- what are uh, some of the systems that you are using like you know what is your head count now i assume it must have crossed 60 Yeah, we are at eighty now. Hmm. So, so what what kind of systems do you have in place for them to work well together? For them to communicate? How does information flow? Like, are you using off the shelf stuff, or have you got something custom built, or you know, what is your technology stack? Hmm. Uh, it's a combination of both. It's about it's not only about using existing tools or something. It's actually a manner of doing work, uh, right? Like putting systems in place uh, for people to. So, so I I told you about that contradiction, right? How do a bunch of imperfect people come together to build a perfect product? The answer is you don't let people fail. That's the answer, and the way we do that is by having enough uh, checkpoints in between, so that people, even if they by mistake do a they like, do a error or something, you find a space to hold them. So I always tell this to the team as well that you know like uh, remember that you or your colleague. or both of you together can make mistakes but put in place something wherein if you make a mistake he'll catch you or if, or if he makes a mistake you will catch it so that could mean like introducing verifications where necessary that could mean like you know like having a third person review it that could mean like always having a sanity check does this make sense when you're neck deep in a design you should take that 5 minutes out once a week to just come out hey what am i doing here right that kind of things those are the systems i'm talking about so we have a lot of that going we also what try to have a lot of focus on product as opposed to function because uh, yeah you could talk engines you could talk tanks but in the end the rocket is a rocket it's it's a combination of all technologies so we should always think uh, you know what are we doing that will deliver something to the vehicle 
as opposed to okay i have done this simulation right or i have done this uh, this formula right and that is only one part of the story so that alone just that ability to think beyond the boundaries functional boundaries actually helps people mm 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 okay and uh, do you use like some uh, workflow tools or project management tools or what do you use for uh, communication or, or these these are like uh, nothing special yeah yeah nothing special is a usual productivity tools that anyone else is using it's about the systems that we have within the company in terms of how people should use it it's not about the tool it's about how people use the tool right? i remember there was a phase in agnikul where everyone was hooked on to this app called asana to managed as have you heard of asana before yeah 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 i have yeah project management i yeah yeah exactly and it's amazing how after 10 days no one wants to try that, right <laughs> okay. so then is when i realized that it's not about the tool it's about how you use the tool and there are so many tools out there it's not a pro- and there are some really cool tools as well right but the point is like what are we how what are we putting in place because of the tool so that i think creating innovative ways to get people to you know do that is where i think i add the most value i think where my co-founder moini also has the most value it's like i think a ceo role or probably any co-founder role is a big hr role is there you're constantly constantly talking about how to improve communication within the team hmm 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 okay and uh, tell me about your customers now so they, they, there is like a customer base falling in place so are these like companies from india are they global companies what uh, you know it's both it's very international and there are also local players uh, local in the sense with the country players uh, so yeah i think see space is actually very global uh, in nature right uh, so very rare to find customers only within one country or something like that but wouldn't there be a logistics cost of shipping the satellite to india like if someone has built a satellite in the us or, or it it's immaterial like it's a small fraction of the it is a fraction of the actual launch cost yeah okay 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 and also there are certain geographic locations that are better off for launching to certain orbits so uh it's almost like yeah it is going to be a uh, bit of a initial cost to come to india to launch but then from india you get access to orbits that you can't get access to from some other places in the world so that alone makes india just a good point and then after that it's about how good your product is and what you're really trying to offer and all that stuff mm-hmm. okay and what kind of companies are these like uh, is it like companies offering broadband internet or like what yeah yeah so you go to space only for two reasons largely uh, one is you go there and take pictures of earth or uh, I, i i i i joke about it in the team as uh, you know we are all in some level enabling selfies from space that's okay. <laughs> uh, right uh, so but the no, ultimate I mean, selfie see, the ultimate selfie yeah with that in your background you're going to go and put take a picture of something but uh, i mean of course there are a lot of applications to taking pictures uh, people track logistics with so that today people track um, you know how weather patterns are changing people track how land usage is changing project large projects are evolving all that stuff uh, and the other big industry is communication which is an example of what you said is the internet part uh, there is now internet of things and there are separate satellite systems for that communication 4g 5g whatever all of the cell phone uh, eventual you know usage goes there so yeah all of those things come together in a customer mm. okay 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 and uh, like who are the uh, investors who backed you now after special like the subsequent fundraisers that happened oh so we had pi ventures uh, lead the next round uh, and after that uh, we had other people like artha and globewester also come in. then in this recent round these are all pi- indian uh, indian uh, yeah, yeah yes and then recently we raised a 11 million dollar round and there we did uh, we the round was led by mayfield india and then our host of other angels who also participated so yeah did it get easier in subsequent round oh, or yeah, did it get definitely. harder me every round is unique and that's one thing i've learned just because i've raised funds three times now doesn't mean i will be easy the fourth time so fundraising is hard 
uh, actually one of my friends used to tell me this uh, very early on when i started and he is actually running a successful startup here he used to say good people and the fundraising are always hard no matter the scale of the startup so that is true but of course you get to know how people think you get to know how to tell a story you get to know what exactly people are looking for i mean at, at the end of it fundraising is about convincing someone that they can put money hmm. how, how did the conversations change from round to round like you know how did the their questions to you change from one so round to the next very different uh, focus points right like in the first round or uh, first uh, like seed round it was about idea and you know core product and founders themselves like me and moen and prof and all that second round was more about the ability to scale the ability to do proof of concept hardware the ability to talk to customers all that and now this last round was more about commercialization what next after this or what after first launch it was very different focus areas Mm-hmm. so in this last round they would have asked you the about the unit economics per launch how much will yeah. you earn and stuff yeah, like yeah, that yeah okay. yeah exactly those kind of questions yes 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 it becomes much more about a profitability part and all that also okay so uh, are you at liberty to talk about uh, you know how does a space company make money like w- what is it that you charge to a customer and what do you earn from one rocket how many launches in a year will you be doing and you know the the more economics part of the business or the finance part i'll probably not give direct answers there i'm going to talk around the beat around the bush a little bit there <laughs> intentionally uh, but i'll say that yeah at least i mean we are so we are in the business of reducing time to go to space right you don't waiting time so it's a bit like instead of taking a bus that will only go at certain times we are giving you a cab to go to space right so that is what we're building so we give you that advantage at the same cost that you will take uh, that a bus will take you so we are on par or slightly cheaper than the industry standard today but what is the industry standard like for one set is it like a per kilo payload or yeah yeah it's a per kg payload it's a very it's like an amazon truck uh, actually like uh, this is a business of getting things from point a to point b it's a transportation business uh, launch vehicle company like agnigol we are building the truck and also driving the truck that's basically the idea right so uh, yeah you usually charge on a per kg basis how much ever you take to space uh, depending upon where you start and where you stop what is the benchmark per kg it's around 30000 dollars per kg roughly today for these small satellites uh, and how many kgs does your satellite would your satellite be carrying like what what is the plan uh, vehicle has a capacity to scale between 30 to 300 uh you can take as little as 30 and be profitable you can go as high as 300 and still the vehicle lack capacity that's the way how how is that possible like 30 to 300 is a fairly large uh, uh range yeah that is actually one of our uh, usps actually so we build our rockets like how uh, typically laptops with ram slots are built right so if you want higher processing power you add a couple of ram slots right uh, ram to your uh, computer right very similarly we have built it in such a manner that the vehicle can be scaled up and down so you can add one one section or you can add another engine and increase the capacity or okay okay that's amazing okay okay and uh, like how many uh, rockets will you build is it now like uh, clear on whether it's a reusable rocket or like you know tell me about that actual part of like you know when you launch the rocket w- what happens next oh then it's about launching more frequently and really getting to on demand right getting them to mm. launch within a two week time frame at best so tell me about the, w- your hypothetical launch like you know w- what are all the things that will get checked off before the launch once it launches what will happen uh, like that if you can like paint a picture of that one launch happening uh yeah so a customer indicates that he or she wants to put say 10 kgs in space so they contact us and then we configure a rocket for them based on where they are launching from where they want to go to and how much they pay will you be clubbing customers or it's like uh... we could it depends on the customers it depends on the orbit it depends on the target uh for this example i'll just take it's one customer we get them we get their satellite so we agree on that we agree on the mission we agree on the trajectory we agree on other metrics that matter for the satellite then we integrate their and then we ask them to basically ship the satellite then it gets integrated with the rocket 
then the rocket itself is taken on a mobile launch pad and the rocket is custom built for that launch yeah yeah, yeah. yes based on the payload you will custom build it uh, yeah exactly based on the payload and the target orbit they want to get and yeah so we take them in a launch we take the vehicle along with the satellite in a uh, you know to the launch pad say let's say sri harikota Uh, how far is that and where where, is, where will the, the rocket be made and where will it go for the launch it will be made in chennai uh, it will be launched from sri harikota how far is that uh 60 to 70 km i think roughly so the the whole rocket goes on top of a truck or like how does that yeah happen? yeah yeah yes 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 it goes on top of a trailer of a large trailer okay okay that, that must be quite a sight on the road <laughs> <laughs> yeah right <laughs> we are also waiting for that moment so you go there then you go to the launch pad then you get set up or basically you have to you have you have a bunch of other trailers that go along with the rocket trailer or where in your pumping stations fueling stations then you know the ground systems for check out and all those things then you take it to the launch pad you erect it uh you make it vertical basically and then you fill the fuel uh and then and everything is right you start the countdown countdown is basically a series of checks that happen at a very well defined set of time intervals so at every every time you come, basically as you're counting down different different things are being g- being given an okay by the flight computer on the ground cast computer okay like fuel and the electronics working the communication working yeah yeah every single system there literally hundreds of systems and everything has to be flawless right so that check happens and then finally at the time that you're planned you basically switch on of your engines and once you develop thrust you let go and then watch <laughs> <laughs> okay hmm. Hmm. so uh, there is a onboard computer which does the navigation yeah, yeah the entire navigation is done by an onboard computer you can't do anything from ground even if you want to it's going too fast hmm and how powerful is that computer is it like equivalent to let's say a snapdragon 8 series or like no nah, it's very simple actually it's probably like uh, it's uh, it's probably like what was there in a, oh, like a 90s or a, the, the pagers and the early cellular phones right that kind of processor is more than enough see because you are actually not doing very uh, very complicated stuff because in the end whatever computation you do uh, mechanical hardware doesn't react as fast as electronic hardware you have an engine that has to be doing the job for you whatever you do that is finally going to be in milliseconds not in nanoseconds or microseconds so so it's actually you can take your time with it but you're going very fast so you can't interfere and you can't bring in humans into the process but for, so because still it's millisecond level decisions right but millisecond level decisions are like a child's play for today's process we are talking micro nanoseconds today so milliseconds is like literally 100x uh, slower so. okay okay and once it uh, is out of the atmosphere then what like it it goes to a specific uh, uh, location in the orbit does it completely exit the atmosphere yeah yeah it goes up to a certain high. so the atmosphere that as we know it becomes very thin by 40 50 km after that it's basically yeah thinner and thinner atmosphere technically yes there is atmosphere but that's more like theoretical atmosphere so uh, till what height does it go yeah as i said 40 to 50 ish km you can say there is some meaningful atmosphere after that it's very very rarefied and beyond 100 or so practically doesn't exist you can say. so your rocket will go till what height so oh, rocket goes to 700 up to 700 depends on the customer but it goes up to 700 mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then once it reaches the desired height uh, then what once it reaches the desired height it ejects the it ejects the uh, satellite out so basically uh, going to orbit means going to a certain height and actually uh uh you know giving enough velocity to a satellite so in that process you end up going fast yourself that's what a rocket does you along with your satellite go very 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 fast and once you have attained the velocity for that height you just basically push the satellite gently out that's it. okay and and through the momentum the satellite stays on that orbit only 
yeah it just continues there's nothing to stop it right basically space is very benign in that sense the atmosphere is where all the action is <laughs> once you've got a space is there's nothing there uh, satellite folks usually take care of radiation protection and thermal protection all that once you take care of those couple of things it simply just stays there there is nothing you will basically work till the point where simply the life runs out of your components because there is nothing else that can kill you that's how you hear about these voyager probes that are well beyond pluto now right launched in 60 or uh, 1960s right they just keep going there's nothing so is <laughs> atmosphere is where all the action is is there like a risk of getting hit by debris and not not in a launch uh, launch is for like 10 minutes to 10 minutes right so debris is not a real problem we do have deorbiting protocols in place so that we don't let anything stay in space for a while so our rockets i'm saying the satellites deorbiting will happen from a satellite customer standpoint for a rocket standpoint we will go put ourselves there and we basically just to slow down ourselves a little bit and that means slowly over a period of time we'll come dk back into our orbit will come back to earth and when it comes back uh, does it like land the way we see those videos of spacex like landing back uh, oh no 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 this is like more like burning off in atmosphere itself completely okay so it's a one time use rocket basically it's an expendable rocket both the first mm-hmm. stage and the second stage of the rocket yes it's expendable rocket what is the first stage and second stage when do they kick in with this there's usually different parts to a rocket so what you do is you you consume a lot of fuel and then you throw off some part of your rocket because you are just carrying empty tanks so that's what is called a stage and so ours is a two stage rocket hmm and both these stages get burnt off they are not really yeah or, or yeah mostly fully burnt off yes second stage definitely first stage too mostly okay Okay, okay. So, uh, Srinath, t- uh, tell me, what is the journey of a rocket? Like, you know, from the time that the, the the demand comes to you till the time that the whole project is like closed. Sure. So, basically, the journey is uh, the journey of an Amazon delivery truck, <laughs> right? Nothing more fancy <laughs> than that. I hope I didn't destroy that with uh, too much simplicity there. But I mean, essentially, that's what happens, right? So a customer sends us a requirement, a mission, uh, and we agree on it. And then he ships the he or she uh, ships the satellite to our place, and we integrate it with the rocket. So that's a little. I mean, essentially, it's like plugging a USB into the rocket. But you know, it's always a little more complex than that. You have to make sure everything works as a checkout. the rocket and the satellite are able to talk to each other once that is uh, done the vehicle is fully assembled and it it could also be like a, a payload from two three different customers that you combine yeah, into right. that could also be that yes that right, right so in that case then we wait for other people to come in as well or again we are okay with dedicated launches so it depends really on what is the minimum mass like once they cross like 30 40 kg we are good to go uh then we assemble the vehicle put it on a trailer and then so uh, you you have a 3d printing process right so so you would have like the 3d printing happening then and there or like yeah yeah yes yeah. so it depends uh, uh, upon the exact requirement right but we probably will have inventory worth for at least one rocket but on the side yeah you can obviously start printing the print uh, you know engines as well on the side start making the tanks as well all these things could happen but expecting there is some inventory in there right so the rocket is integrated with the nose cone part of it and then the tanks are integrated to that and then the engine then the same thing happens to the say first stage the bottom stage where there is a long tanks and i mean you might be aware of this but just to read it a rocket is mostly just tanks right there is a little bit of engine stuff at the bottom there is one small satellite on top or otherwise it's a lot of just empty tanks that's what any rocket is any time you see a rocket remember that you are seeing a bunch of tanks okay not okay more than that. Uh, in the bottom you have engines on the top you have the satellite that's it so we integrate that based on what some combination of what's in the inventory what will be live uh, 3d printing and stuff then the rocket is put together and then this whole journey like a you know uh, like a road trip starts basically not just of the rocket and uh, at the rocket and then all its supporting systems go in another 40 feet uh you know trailer it's all about like 40 feet container based approaches uh to you know taking the rocket from point a to the launch pad wherever that is uh so we go there and uh then 
so that will be like say the filling station the pumping station the water cooling station the uh, you know some of the uh, stations for monitoring the performance of the rocket you know the one that you see on tv right where the people bunch of people sitting on a monitor and looking at what's going on all of these things along with the data acquisition systems for that we move all of that along with this so it'll be like this fleet of 40 feet containers going to the launch pad on the launch pad you again start assembling these together you basically erect the vehicle the vehicle was horizontal so far you basically make it vertical then you give a lot of connections you connect the plumbing the electrical ones there's a lot of things that the rocket uh, you it's basically like you're charging the vehicle for its batteries you're filling the tank it's 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 getting ready for the journey right so plumbing is for the cooling like where, what is the plumbing for uh the plumbing is for filling the tanks basically and then also for uh, the jet plumes that come out for cooling them yes so all this while the bunch of people who are sitting on the other side uh you know in the vision control room and just checking if every single sensor is working and they have a bunch of them that runs well into the high triple digit right uh and then there are valves and the computer stuff so, so every electronic board goes through an elaborate testing mechanism where after they are they went board to the launch pad because you want to make sure that you didn't miss out on anything in the in the journey to the launch pad right so that uh, that happens uh so once all that is done basically then we say okay we'll officially start the countdown okay and how many days does it take to reach countdown like you know from when you dispatch the uh, dispatch it to the road till uh so usually it's about 2 to 3 days of work on the launch pad so i'm discounting the journey to the launch pad right because that's just simply very slowly driving the vehicle <laughs> that's a little boring but once you get to the launch pad it's about getting through to uh, the check there right so that's what we basically do uh, once that part is over the next step here is to uh, you know make sure that we are officially ready to start the countdown once we start the countdown basically what is a countdown a countdown is uh, a, a, a manner a very very disciplined and organized manner of checking everything in the rocket that's all a countdown is so you basically have a very elaborate checklist and uh, you do it with the time uh, involved to it so just so that you know people are all coming together it's literally a management process basically and you just keep checking every second this happens that happens so many things have to be done and there is a time angle to it as well because usually your launch point or your launch window as they call it right the time of launch is fixed because <clears throat> at that point in time you've already notified um, you know people in the sea you've notified uh, airmen flying around that there's going to be a rocket so that part is fixed so you're going to go back and try to figure out all these things right uh, just to make sure that you time it all right so that when that moment comes you're ready to go that's what a countdown is in the meantime two other things that have happened you'd have alerted the range safety people of the launch pad when they let you inside their premises so they'll be making sure that the vehicle is able to talk to them and just to be very clear what it talks to them, when it talks to them we can't interfere they have full authority to kill the vehicle if they want to because if it's doing something wrong we can't have it be an hazard right so that has to be the so that they have the ability to uh, stop the mission at any point uh, both before and after lift off right so that happens and then after that we continue working on this uh, you know checking 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 this is this core vehicle team is only doing checking all the time that's all 20 40 hours of this checking Uh, on the other side people are all getting busy trying to get all the other clearances ready making sure that all of the you know notices are in place seamen airmen have been notified and all that and then uh, what happens is somewhere around 4 to 5 hours before we start the fuel filling process uh fuel filling process is actually first it is done for all of the kerosene stuff so we have kerosene liquid oxygen engines the kerosene stuff that part starts and all of that filling happens the batteries are charged uh vehicle is basically you know you move all the parts of the moving and you see whether things move it's literally like warming up right there's a warm up exercise that happens and uh, after that you start putting in the fuel that is a little more complex to handle which is liquid oxygen right so the liquid oxygen loading starts and that's a slow process because you have to cool the engine, tank the engine and then only you have to load it and all that happens but you're basically getting to the last phase of launch 
right so by now the vehicle is fully you know getting ready uh once the oxygen is in place fully that is basically it i mean after this you don't have time actually because if you leave it oxygen will again start evaporating uh right so so that's about the last bit in fact i think we try to do it all the way to about 10 minutes or so before launch 20 15 minutes uh but yeah what of it like you can decide that based on the mission based on the requirements and local uh, geography and all that stuff this happens and then uh yeah once that process is over all the manual checks get completed and then we basically transfer control to the flight computer so uh, so far you were controlling everything from the ground computer you were turning on valves turning off valves everything was being done by a human but at some point like this usually happens about 60 seconds to 120 seconds before lift off you give control to the flight computer and the reason is you don't want to do that at the last minute because anyway finally the flight computer only has to do the job and doing that two last minute will will give you very little time to react in case things are going wrong so you give control to the flight computer and in the meantime you immediately check if everything is still okay because now you have basically given control to someone else right and then this is, it it must be like very nervous two minutes like yeah. like those last two minutes <laughs> we count on and even we do our engine firing and i think uh, you know we did one last week as well and every 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 count on whether this for a ground test or a launch or whatever is is always nervous because you you there is a time ticking and at the same time a lot of things have to go right and uh, you have one shot at it basically right so it's sort of that moment so this happens yeah and so you do the last you you keep now you can't do any checks the flight computer is doing checks and simply reporting the data to you and you just make hoping that everything is okay and uh, and then it usually the thing that gets announced on mic and all that is the last 10 seconds right it up to lift up so at around t minus 3 or 4 seconds your engines come to life basically you make sure that all of the engines are producing enough thrust and then and that happens for a certain uh, like one or one and a half seconds usually and then after that point you let go and that's it vehicle basically lifts off it goes straight up for some time just to clear obstacles and then it does a little bit of a pitch over pitch over in the sense it gently tilts in to the ocean basically you want to go over the uh, you want to go into a uh, you know a, 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 a tangential direction right you can you basically in orbit for being in orbit you need to be parallel to the ground not perpendicular so you kind of pitch over and that will also take you over the ocean where you you feel a lot better because now you are over ocean even if things go wrong <laughs> there's no problem for anyone uh so that happens and in between this you would have had the first milestone basically you cleared your launch pad so that itself is a big thing uh because uh the, no vehicle is perfectly stable so the moment you let go the vehicle will try to tilt over in some direction right it's a little bit like trying to balance a pen on its tip right so the moment you let go it will try to fall but then you're continuously correcting for it and clearing so once you clear launch pad then you do the pitch over and then you keep going and then the vehicle uh goes through a uh you know it, it really rapidly gains velocity and uh, at the point there comes a point which is called the max q point which is the point where the vehicle lo- faces the maximum load right and usually if you watch a launch and even for us that is a big moment once you cross that moment you basically know that the vehicle has been through the worst so that's the, that's the, the point where usually there are there is a lot of applause in the mission control room because you know the vehicle has taken has borne the brunt of most of the problems right so then you continue on your journey after that it's it continues it keeps gaining velocity and altitude and at a point comes where your stage 1 is basically not very useful anymore it you've almost burnt all your fuel in it so at the right when the right moment comes you you kill your engines there you basically shut off your engines and then you 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 basically give, the flight computer actually tells the stage to separate so the stage then falls off and the remaining part of so the, the, that stage would be like the the lower the bottom half of the rocket yeah, or yeah. something yes, like yes, that yes. and then that falls off uh, and in the second stage which is now there it continues uh, in the, it it fires and that typically it, falls into the ocean and that's like a one time use that's a one time use rocket yes and what spacex is done for example is to catch that and bring it back uh or try to bring it back directly but basically yeah that's that's exactly what happens 
second stage continues for us it's a two stage rocket so second stage continues and it keeps going second stage is actually very uh, you know uh, easy in a way because your outside atmosphere and trust me you're going on a journey of 600 and 700 kilometers but the first 10 kilometers is where all the problems are because of atmosphere it's unpredictable there are winds and there is a lot happening on the rocket uh, like for example if we were to for some reason go and live on the moon launching rockets would not at all be a big deal there is no atmosphere yeah most of the problems come when there is atmosphere so so you are outside there and then you have a lot more uh, lever to you know f- go in whatever attitude you want direction you want you can say as where you want and eventually you slowly make your way towards making uh, going towards the light point that you want to get into an orbit and when you are close enough there uh, if you basically once you get into that moment right at that point you know that your satellite you've reached the point where your satellite wants to go to and then you eject your payload and uh, it's just basically literally pushed out with a very gentle velocity uh, it's almost like pushing a door like closing a door that kind of uh, pushes all wall that is given and after that the satellite just continues on its way to orbit and with that the vehicle itself is done with its job so it basically what it does something called passivation it empties itself of all the fuel because it's going to be floating there for a bit before coming down we don't want any accidents to happen in case there is a collision or something so you you do something called passivation or uh, or basically making the vehicle inert all uh, right and you're there for some time and then after that uh, what is some time like couple of days or uh, it could be a couple of weeks maybe or a little more uh, but you slowly decay down and it's a very uh, positive feedback uh, process like the more you go down the more you will be pulled faster down because you lose speed rapidly because of atmosphere but that takes some time it's like a spiral inward uh, towards earth and yeah and then you fall back but and was you were able to predict where it will fall like yeah reasonably well uh, reasonably well but more importantly for small rockets like ours it completely burns up on the way back there'll be nothing left it won't even actually have an impact uh there is very little left uh, in the vehicle when it comes back so fully burn up that's it in the meantime the satellite has just been ejected will wake up till now it has been on sort of sleep mode so and then it wakes up once you get uh, once it has been put out and then it slowly literally starts testing one system at a time hey are you okay and it starts communicating to earth and then literally starts with a hello world and slowly goes back to <laughs> full full waking up state and then it starts doing its job based on uh, what people below say so a satellite sting is very uh, it need not be automated because you have a lot of time worst case hey you know what just wait for some time it'll come back again over you <laughs> right the rocket is not like that so so but yeah that's basically the idea amazing the, this whole journey gives me goosebumps it it just sounds i mean you know sounds like something out of what i would have read in science fiction when i was a kid right yeah it's still we, we do this a day in and day out and even for us it's actually fascinating to think of it i every countdown makes me <laughs> nervous makes me get that high right it's an uh, adrenaline uh, uh, you know pumping event any 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 day how many other times you do it? so uh, you know you had told me that you learned about rules of thumb and you know wh- what are like the rules of thumb for uh, a rocket company like do, do you have like some Some, some of those in your mind oh yeah uh, i mean that's all i talked about to the team so yes definitely uh, one thing the first rule of thumb is uh, how much of mass uh, that you add to one stage will take you will how much payload will it cost you right so in your first stage for example if you put in say i'm just randomly picking numbers here because i don't want to talk about our rocket but generally speaking right say for example if you if you take out if you add uh, say 10 kg to your first stage right 1 kg of your actual payload capacity is gone so and we have this it's not perfect but it's a very helpful metric so if someone comes and you know is brainstorming okay i need to either add 10 kg or i need to pay up another 100000 dollars then it's easy to make those decisions once you know this so that's one rule of thumb the other rule of thumb is uh, uh mostly on the uh, the lines of okay uh, in case your engine is down in efficiency or performance by 1% what is the orbit you're going to how much how, how much error will you have in your orbit 
right so every 1% uh, drop in engine performance uh, in engine performance is 10 kilometers of altitude so that is another metric that we try to uh, you know constantly check with uh, and then there are all sorts of sensitivities. What happens if one kg of, of extra fuel is added? What, what happens if one kg of extra fuel leaks? And we always talk about it in terms of payload capacity. So that those kind of rules of uh, thumb are useful. Then comes the question of, uh, I mean, this probably I think is outside of a rocket company as well, right? But I mean, at least for us, we use. So how long can you wait on a decision? <laughs> right? I always use that. I try to I try to parameterize uh, opportunity cost in the company. So I say, okay, you waited for two days. Let's say this is the like say fifty people are working in the team. Each of those people, uh, each of those uh, persons are actually spending say about twenty percent of their time on it. So that's like about say ten people roughly, right? Ten people working full time. What's their salary <laughs> and two days of not getting the job done? What's the opportunity cost for that? So I always say use that as a rule of thumb to make quick decisions because sometimes the trade offs are really really tight. And sometimes you get into the action of making a very elaborate trade-off as opposed to being decisive. I'm, I'm sure other companies do this as well, but I'm just this is something that we use all the time. No, that's that's fascinating. That that way to think about decision making is fascinating. Oh, is it okay? Because I I actually got the inspiration for it from uh, AXA when I was in New York, right? And they had this. I had this manager who actually once started timing the uh, cost of every meeting. Okay, it was amazing stuff. So every time you go in and come out of the meeting, I mean, obviously, I didn't know everyone's salaries, but then he had his assistant do it for us. And he'd be like, hey, you know what? That meeting just cost us $10,000. We better get something done. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what? That was, it was just like 70 people sitting and talking. It was $10,000 gone. So it's just ingrained in me this idea that actually, you know what? You should put a meter to your meetings. So that you know what you're spending, it really actually directly measures the value of time. And to be very clear, that's only half the measurement, right? Because there is a lot of hidden things that happen when you don't do things. Like, for example, let's say I was supposed to do a launch today, but I'm only doing it tomorrow. And because of that, a customer, I lose credibility with a customer or something. How do you put a value on that? That's very hard. But outside of that, these things are very obvious to measure. So I yeah that this is some rules of thumb and some tricks we use to be decisive and keep things focused. So what is like your uh, you know wildest dream about Agnikul? Like you know one is you would have of course like you know more short term ambitions, but but you know so for example, do you see like say SpaceX valuation is around seventy eighty billion? Uh, you know do you see Agnikul? becoming a competitor to SpaceX and Blue Origin as as like your long-term wild dream? Like, you know, what are those dreams like? So my long-term wild dream with Agnikul is uh, really actually not too much on the financial side. I mean, I do think if you do the right things, people will pay us for it and automatically money and valuation and all that will come. Uh, I really want to make it look like, uh, you know, going to space shouldn't be that big a deal for anyone or anything. And uh, as I think, I I mean, I, I think I told this multiple times to team as well, uh, right? Uh, re, uh, like it should, getting to space should be like getting to a, 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 a country that's quite far away from India, not more than that. Like if you can, from India, if you can go to the US, I mean, from India, you should be able to go to space. Uh, interestingly, India to US, I think is like some 12,000 miles and we are talking 700 kilometers, right? Chennai to Hyderabad, I think is more than that. So you just have to do it in the right direction. <laughs> That's all it takes, <laughs> right? So, so, so I I feel like that part should be simplified. So, I think yeah, t- in being a competitor or you know being as big as Blue Origin or SpaceX is definitely a nice ambition to have as a means to that goal, right? I feel like because they are doing different things, and I think they have been an inspiration in some ways, and they obviously we can compete with them as well. It might come to that finally. But the point is not that. The point is to make sure that, okay, we should be, like, today, I think, uh, if you tell me you're going from Chennai to Delhi, I'd be like, hmm, okay, and just stay, go on with other <laughs> things. It should be like that to go to lower earth orbit at So, you, like, satellites is just step one. Like, you would eventually also want to have human beings. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Transportation in all forms and manner uh, for both uh, things and people and everything. Definitely, definitely, yes. It's the most natural progression, right?
Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, and would you look at like you know uh, there there are different approaches that different companies are taking. You know, like Virgin has its own approach, and SpaceX has its own approach, and Blue Origin has its own approach. So, which of these approaches are you more bullish about that you think would be a, a better bet in terms of when you reach that large scale transportation kind of a scenario? Oh, uh, I you know. I think I. You know, when both both companies and in fact everyone is now focused on it's becoming a privatized commodity, right? Transportation as such to space. So it is definitely about making costs affordable, making it like a you know like a meaningful transportation business. I mean, a lot of people today know how to run a transportation business, right? For ground transportation, and the same rules apply to space transportation as well. So I think all those approaches definitely work. I think right now the biggest problem to solve for is. both the you know the, the 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 cost it takes to go to space i i really think it should get ridiculously cheap I, we are talking about reduction in prices of the order of 1000 times from where it is today right only then i think it will become truly everyone's everyone's uh, you know a uh, 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 thing to do it otherwise again you're going to have it like being only approachable for a certain group of people which will always keep it as an elite thing Right, as opposed to saying, "Hey, it's just seven hundred kilometers." I mean, everyone can go from Chennai to Hyderabad, so you should be able to go that much higher in space. So that's, I think, the approach-wise, both companies, at least SpaceX and Blue Origin, both do things very differently. But everyone is trying to make it cheap. I think that part everyone is unified on. Hmm, hmm, hmm. But, but what I mean, are you also looking at reusable in the future as a strategy, or you know, like? any like in terms of what approaches they are taking any preferences which you think or any judgment call on which is a good approach uh yeah reusability i think uh, what uh, uh, what spacex is doing is very much about actually re- being reusable in a planet where there is no atmosphere right uh, because they don't want to use air to come back uh, blue origin actually has never gone truly orbital before but for space transportation i think what they are doing is definitely a cool thing is going up and coming back down uh so yeah both those those are propulsive landings right so those are good but i think see, generally my perspective on reality is on reusability is it really depends on what is the cost you're saving right if this if you think about why reuse it's a question of cost now the thing that not many people at least outside the industry they don't talk about is what is the cost of reusing something right so you compare the cost of reusing to cost of throwing it away Okay, what is the cost of reusing? Cost of reusing has two things in it. One is you always give up on payload capacity when you try to reuse a vehicle. So like for example, uh, Falcon Nine, the SpaceX vehicle actually burns its engines a little bit before coming down, right? Uh, only then it is able to slow itself, right? And it has a variety of hardware on the rocket to make sure it is able to come back. Now the revenue that they have given up trying to reuse their ro- uh, rocket. right the revenue that goes into uh you know the payload that is lost in terms of capacity the revenue that goes into or the money that goes into the other hardware and then of course the money that goes into refurbishing right that should be actually less than the cost of the stage itself otherwise it doesn't make sense right it's a simple mathematical relation at that point so i feel for a very small rocket it becomes like a use and throw pen it just doesn't make sense to say if i'm having 100 kg capacity right let's say i end up spending 40 kg to reuse my re, i end up you know paying in terms of payload capacity 40 kg to just get my vehicle back i've lost half my revenue right so why unless it makes sense that you know my half my the vehicle that i'm the part of the vehicle that i'm saving is actually worth half my revenue why would i do that now the equation tilts actually in favor of larger vehicles doing that because for them it will not be 100 to say 60 kg right it could be like say 10 tons to 6 tons now that's a lot 4 tons is a lot and because that you get paid in per uh, per kg right dollars per kg so that's a lot and that's why i think a falcon 9 reusability makes sense like arnivan reusability right now from whatever basic calculations we have it still feels like it's too close right yeah you might save a little of course you save a little but is it worth it is the question so when we go to larger rockets yeah definitely we'll also explore that okay so my last question to you 
you know, you envision a future in which space travel is just like going from Chennai to Hyderabad. How do you think that will uh, change the way a, a human society is? You know, like, for example, way back in the 50s and 60s when computers had just come in, people probably did not uh, see or some people might have seen how pervasively computers will change society. But, but So what do you think space travel will do to yeah, humanity? A uh, wonderful question. Uh, so I think two things will happen, right? First of all, being able to see Earth from a distance will will increase our sense of you know unity, sense of you know the uh, being together. I mean that is it, right? Like that is that w- once you can see the entirety of the planet in one shot, the feeling that that is everything that you have ever experienced will quickly sink in. Right? So I feel actually it will bring everyone closer. All of the boundaries that exist, if you look at all of the man-made boundaries, I mean, right, sovereign nations, borders, international borders, airspace, I mean, all of that would just melt away once you look at pl- the planet from far enough. Because you understand. Hmm. There are no nation boundaries visible from yes, space. Exactly, right. Only, only, only land versus water, that's about it. And that's how the planet has uh, was and has always been. So that will happen. So it's a very powerful feeling, I think. Uh, and also, I'm a big fan of uh, Arthur C. Clarke uh, novels, right? As I told, so and and he always talks about how space is going to be the final factor that unifies humanity, because if enough people are able to see Earth for what it is, right, it'll really bring people together. And I truly believe in that. Second thing I think is it'll make us appreciate how precious the planet is, uh, right? Uh, you know, once you go up, you'll realize that it's mostly empty except for this one. <laughs> one blue ball below which is where you have to be uh, right and that feeling is like we'll immediately tell you that oh my god i better take care of my planet so we you will get that i think that change in perspective i think a lot of astronauts actually experience that is what i have read uh it is like they can never see earth again the same way uh it just changes their perspective on how precious our planet is for all of us so that would happen and i also think the last thing that would happen is you truly start understanding the context of, you know, where our species fits in, in the big picture, the big questions that, you know, the existential questions, right? Who am I? What do I do? I think it basically people will all become slightly more philosophical. And I think that's that's a good thing for all of us. Right. Yeah. And I'm sure you're looking forward to piloting or being on the first agnical uh, human Carrier's rocket. Yeah, definitely. I do now need to check with my wife on that, but yeah, it's definitely in the plan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. All right, cool. To follow the journey of Agni Kul and keep a tab on India's first private sector rocket launch, do visit agnikul.in. You like the Founder Thesis podcast? Then do check out our other shows on subjects like marketing, technology, career advice, books, and drama. Visit thepodium.in, that is T H E P O D I U N dot I N, for a complete list of all our shows. This episode of Founder Thesis Podcast is brought to you by Long Haul Ventures. Long Haul Ventures is the long haul partner for founders and startups that are building for the long haul. More about them is at www.longhaulventures.com.